memory. And uh, we're going to talk about different technologies in this talk. Uh, first, I will cover the prototype chip design using the RN technology. And then I will talk about 3D integration and also introduce a new technology to implement the computing memory, which is uh, called ferroelectric technologies. Next, keep on, okay. So uh, this is a brief uh, background. I'm pretty sure that many of you are very familiar with the AI hardware trends these days. As you know, the AI applications are you know, helping us in our daily life. For example, here I show just the two examples. The first one is the autonomous driving. And so here the computer vision algorithms help us to guide the, you know, navigate the uh, 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 roadway. And uh, then the second example is also very popular today, you know, the natural language processing and the chat GPT is a good example. So those AI applications, of course, demand the hardware platforms to execute those workloads. And here, if you look at the hardware platform to run those algorithms, of course, you have the mainstream technologies like CPU, GPU, and also today, many companies are designing their custom chip uh, for the ASIC implementations. And here, one example is the systolic array uh, proposed by Google, and which is deployed in Google's TPU cluster. So here, if you look at the uh, energy efficiency to run those workloads, so here I call the number tera operations per second per watt. Essentially, is the throughput divided by the power. So here, GPU is typically less than one T ops per watt. And if you do the uh, digital systolic array, which essentially is like a near memory computing paradigm, you can boost the efficiency to a few T ops per watt. But still, in the digital systolic array, so here the computation is done at this PE processing element with those digital multiplier and adders. And then the data, most of the data, including the weights and activations, are still stored in the shared SRAN, like global buffer. So you still need to fetch the data from the memory into the computational units to do the actual computation. So still there's a data movement cost in this paradigm. So essentially we have to break this memory wall problem in the computer architecture. And this motivates us to look into the computing memory approach. Not moving. Keyboard not moving. Okay, so here, uh, computing memory, of course, here we are trying to boost the energy efficiency by another one order of magnitude towards like 100 T ops per watt. And uh, we can still use the same technology available to us, for example, SRAN to do the computing memory. And there are many researchers on that, on that direction as well. But here we're interested in the number of memory solutions. For example, RRAN, resistive random access memory. The reason is that if we look at the applications, for example, the edge intelligence, where you will have a lot of standby scenario, then the leakage power is very high if you use the SRAN technology. So for the edge applications, we prefer the long volatile memory solutions, for example, RRAN. But still, I believe that for SRAN implementations, the cloud is still a very good target for the SRAM-based computing memory, because SRAM can still enjoy the same scaling to today's three nanometer and two nanometer in the very soon. So the SRAM is still a competitive technology in terms of the performance in the high performance scenario. But for the edge, we believe that the number of memory solution could help, especially for the standby leakage. So we have demonstrated the RRAM computing memory chips, and then the question is, what is the next? So here we believe that switching the technology from RRAM to ferroelectric devices could be another major breakthrough in the future. And we will briefly talk about that at the very end of today's presentation.
All right, so let's start from the basics of the computing memory. And uh, some of you may be familiar with this, but let me uh, recap what is uh, the computing memory. So essentially it's doing the mixed signal compute. And if you have a neural network, you can map the input activation into the voltages that are input to the memory array. And then the weights of the algorithm could be mapped as the conductance of the memory cell. And then the dot product between the input vector and then the weight matrix would be performed in parallel. So here we turn on multiple rows of the memory array, and then the input voltage will be multiplied by the conductance of the memory cell, which will result in a current. And this current can actually be summed up along the column. So at the end of the column, then we have the weighted sum current. And this represents the dot product between the input and the weight matrix. And then we need to somehow digitize this end current uh, through the, for example, the ADC circuitry. And then depending on the precision, we may need to do some post-processing, for example, the shift and add to reconstruct the weight significance. Uh, so here, this is a generic diagram for the computing memory, but uh, in terms of the actual implementations, the memory cell could have multiple uh, options. So first, as I said, the SRAN technology can still be used in this paradigm. And uh, uh, to address the rate disturb issue, the ATS RAN cell is more preferred in this uh, scenario. And but of course, you have to pay for eight transistors uh, cost in terms of the uh, 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 area. And then a well, more compact form would be this 1T1R implementation, where the R could be a variable resistor that could be offered by many technologies like RAN, MRAN, phase change memory, and so on. And then the last uh, implementation is this uh, FEFET, ferro electric field effect transistor. And in this case, is a single transistor solution because this transistor's threshold voltage could be tuned. Therefore, the channel conductance could represent the weight value. And uh, here we address a few number of time memory technologies. So let me uh, dig a little into the technology by itself. And here I just uh, show some basic basic mechanism for those uh, technologies. Uh, so here the RN is mostly based on this filamental switching where you can create a conductive filament in some insulator material, for example, half oxide. And then this vacancy based uh, uh, filament could conduct the current and uh, 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 this represents the low resonance state. And then you can also break or rupture this filament by reversing the voltage polarity. And then you can create a gap between the electrode and then the residue of the filament. Therefore, you have a turning gap. You have the high resonance state. And then the M run uh, is based on the MTJ uh, ma magnetic uh, terminal junction, and uh, this also could represent the high and low resistance state depending on the orientation of your uh, magnetization. And if you have anti-parallel configuration, you have higher resistance. And if you have a parallel configuration, you have lower resistance. Of course, in the MRAN, the resistance ratio or the TMR ratio is pretty small. And then the phase change memory is based on the charcoal genetic material, for example, the GST 225. And uh, uh, this depends on the atomic arrangement of those uh, atoms. You could have the amorphous state or uh, the crystalline state. So if you have the amorphous state, then you have a higher resistance state. And then here, this amorphous state could be achieved by passing a large current through the charcoal material. Therefore, you melt the material, and then you do a quick quench, uh, quench process. You can result in this amorphous random uh, configuration you can create a higher resistance. If you gradually apply a small voltage of small current, you can recover or anneal this region to make it more crystalline in phase. So you can switch between those two states. So I would say those three candidates are all belong to two terminal technology. Right? Essentially, it's a resistor with variable resistance. And then the last candidate, ferroelectric field effect transistor, is a three-terminal device. 
is still a transistor. The only difference is that the gate stack is replaced by a very natural layer. And then this very natural layer has built-in dipole. And depending on the dipole's orientation, you can tune the threshold voltage. So here, I would say the ferro fetch has a unique advantage compared to the resistive memories. Uh, that is, three terminal, you decouple the read and the write pass. So the write is done through the gate, and then the read is you read out the current from the source and the drain. So the read and the write pass are decoupled, therefore the reliability could be improved. And another advantage is that uh, because this is a field-driven switching from the gate, so the switching energy is pretty low. So if you scale the technology to like 28 nanometer or beyond, then the switching energy for the ferro should be less than femtojoule per bit. Because the you do not pass the current to switch, you only apply the field. So this is different from the R or M run, which you have to pass large current, typically like tens of micron -ion or even 100 micron. -ion. So the switching energy is much lower in the uh, FE FET. All right, so then this is the outline of my presentation. First, I will give some uh, background and challenges for the RM compute, based computing memory. And then I will go through two tape outs uh, my group has done in the past uh, two or three years uh, in collaboration with TSMC. And so here we have the two generations, 49 R RM computing memory macro. And I will go through some features we embedded to the design. And next, I will talk about how to scale up the system design if we have those macros, because still those tape out chip is pretty small. Um, if we want to stack to a larger system, we have to think about how to use the company memory macro in its best way. And then lastly, I will talk about switching the technology from RN to ferro electric, which may give more promise in the future. Okay. So here are many prior arts of the RM-based computing memory designs in the past few years, and I just quote a few from the recent publications. And uh, uh, there are many groups uh, working in this field, and uh, one notable group is Professor Marvin Chang's group, uh, which will also have active collaborations. And uh, uh, he has demonstrated many of those uh, uh, pioneering designs using the RM for the computing memory. And here I just summarize some design challenges because the RN technology is not perfect for the computing memory. There are many uh, challenges. As you know, RN technology was initially you know, developed by the foundries for uh, applications like the embedded number of time memory for the e-flash replacement, typically used for the you know, microcontroller application. Still, this is the main market for the RN technology today, if you ask the TSMC folks. Uh, so here, if you want to use RM for computing memory, then we have to address several challenges. So first, uh, RM has a typically small on-off ratio. Of course, it's larger than MRAN, but still, it's quite limited. This is because if we turn on multiple rows, we want the on-off ratio to be large to differentiate the, let's say, all the rows are in the off state compared with one row, which is in the on state. So how many rows? could be turned on, depending on the on-off ratio. And second, so we have to address some security challenges. I will address that in a minute. And third, we need to think about the ADC design. If we use voltage mode sensing, then we have to think about how those sense amplifiers could be robust to the process variation and also the temperature. That's basically PVT rep process uh, uh, voltage and uh, uh, temperature variation. And then if we want to lower the VDD to boost the energy efficiency, then we will further degrade the sense margin. And then for the typical uh, testing, then if you only have the external tester, then it's very slow to program you know, entire RAM array. And we have to speed up the initial uh, programming. And then there are many non-ideal effects and uh, also the quantization loss due to the ADC. So I will address some of those challenges and the potential solutions in the next uh, few slides. Oops. 
So the first uh, uh, tape out. So here is this is a block diagram of the first tape out. So it's a 128 by 128 RAM array and with the peripheral circuits. So here is the uh, uh, two corners uh, represent the digital block and the analog blocks. So the analog blocks are designed mostly manual, and then the digital blocks are you know designed through the synthesis from the RTL to the you know placement and the routes. And uh, uh, here we have the uh, peripheral circuit control and then the ADC and then the post processing. So let me just go through some design challenges and the potential uh, solutions. So to address the limited on off ratio and uh, the relative low efficiency, so we utilize a sparsity aware input controller to skip some of the rows which has the input zero. Therefore we can uh, enable more rows uh, simultaneously. If the input is zero, then we can skip that. And also we uh, in, in, encrypt the weights on the chip. So I will discuss why we want to do that in a minute. Uh, because those weights are valuable. Uh, the as and those weights are assets you want to protect. And then for the uh, chip testing, we add the on-chip write and verify circuitry to speed up the programming of the RN cells. And then for the ADC design, we have the on-chip references to calibrate the PVT uh, variations. And then finally, to improve the uh, robustness, especially at lower VDD, then we introduce the ECC error co uh, correction code. Uh, which is a little bit different from the conventional ECC I will introduce in a minute, because we still want to preserve the parallelism in the computation and with the in situ we call Mac ECC scheme. So first, let me introduce the compute scheme. So input sparsity control. As I said, this is a pretty straightforward. So we are going to pre-check what is the input vector. And if the input vector as the zero, then we are going to skip turning on that row. So we will accumulate, always accumulate it until eight rows, uh, let's say seven rows uh, contains one, then we will turn on those seven rows simultaneously because we use three bit ADC, so we can do seven rows uh, at most. So here then this is a, uh, a very simple design. We just need to have some control uh, from the input side. And then here by the estimation, we can improve the energy efficiency and the compute efficiency, especially when the input sparsity is high, which is typically true for most of the neural network applications. And then for the sensing side, this design has a very simple de uh, uh, implementation. So here we have a, a max to select which column to re read out. This is because the ADC area still dominates the chip area. So we cannot have the column pitch matching. Let's say one column has one ADC, then this is a very difficult from the layout point of view. And here we have a, a, a seven sense amp, uh, uh, essentially a, a very simple three bit flash ADC. And uh, uh, then after the ADC, we have some uh, post processing. So let me discuss why we want to add the security to this chip. So this is because your neural network model, you know, uh, the, when the companies develop the algorithm, you know, to train a neural network model, then it will take a lot of resources, right? And, and like cluster of GPU and you train the model for like uh, one month. So if you deploy the model to this like an inference chip, then this chip, you know, is deployed to the field. So anyone can, you know, access to the chip and read out the weights. Then your model is leaked, right? Essentially, anyone can reconstruct your model. Uh, so here we want to protect the uh, model because uh, uh, here if, if you read out the memory data, then you essentially get all the weights. So here we just use a very simple uh, XOR cipher to encode the uh, weights. And when you decrypt the weights, it's very simple. You just add a key uh, to the input. 
So essentially, we have to prepare a complementary pattern for the weights. So we have the weight true and the weight you know, uh, inverted. So with the correct key, then we can turn on correct row to decrypt. So essentially here, when we apply the key, we do not apply the key to the weight. We apply the key to the input, and then we can do the XOR operation there. So with this skin, then we can evaluate how effective the encryption could be. So for a small network like VGG8, then for the CIFAT data set, turns out that if you encrypt a single layer, and so here you have the seven layers in total, if you encrypt a single layer and then under the random guess attack, then the accuracy is pretty low. That means the adversary could not reconstruct your model, which is good. But for some of those ResNet uh, applications, so here, because the ResNet has some bypass uh, 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 feature, so here if you encrypt only certain layers, then sometimes the adversary can still recover your accuracy. Uh, so this is not good. So we have to select a few layers to encrypt. For example, if you uh, encrypt layer two and layer five, then the accuracy under attack would be pretty low. This is for uh, uh, the ImageNet uh, 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 data set. Okay, so then the next feature we implemented to the chip is the on-chip write and verify. So this is unique to the uh, company memory with RN technology because we have to tighten the uh, distribution of the RN resistance. This is different from the digital memory application. So digital memory application, you just need to distinguish the um, uh, high resistance state and low resistance state. As long as you have a large gap between those two distribution, you are fine. But here for the complete memory, because we sum up the anode resistance on the anode current based on the conductance. So we have to tighten the distribution. And uh, here we utilize a dual uh, sensor uh, with uh, a very accurate uh, sensing. So we can tighten the distribution of those uh, RN uh, cells in entire array. So here, let me show you some data measured from the chip. So here, uh, depending on the threshold we put to the sensor, so we can tighten the distribution of the RN cells uh, within certain window. So for example, if we a, a, a set the window is around 200 ohm, then we can achieve a, a very tightened distribution. Or if we relax the sense margin to 400 ohm, then we can have a little bit relaxed distribution. But my point is that we have to tighten the distribution around its center. So this is pretty challenging. And uh, if you compare, uh, 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 if you want to use the RN technology for the computation, because any deviation from the center will be aggregated at the output current. This is different from the digital application. Let me give you some example. So TSMC does not allow me to disclose the exact value, but let, let me say a few kilo ohm, okay? So, so, so uh, 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 the center is a few kilo ohm, and then you want to tighten the distribution within hundreds of ohm. And uh, this is no run state. And high run state, we can target on off ratios about seven. So here we want to tighten the high resistance state higher than seven times of the low resistance state. So here uh, we have to do this right and verify to hit the target. So it's pretty challenging. This is different from the memory application. In memory application, you can, you know, uh, uh, as long as you on and off are separate, then you are fine. But here, even within the on, you want it to be centered in that median value of the on state, which is pretty challenging for the RN. Consider the variations from cycle to cycle programming, from the cell to cell variation. So here are some protocol to tighten the neural state. And essentially, we do this write and verify, and let's use these two cells as example. For example, the first cell, we start from here, the high resistance state, and then a single pulse somehow overshoot 
the target lower than the boundary of the lower the lower lower side of the lower end state. Then we have to reset it and then redo the gradual set and until it reach the target, which is between those two boundaries. And the second cell then is um, uh, um, more, uh, uh, more gradual. So this really depends on the stochastic behavior of the technology. So it's hard to predict. We have to, you know, do the uh, uh, verify through cycles. And for the similarly for the high state, but high state state is pretty more uh, is more straightforward. We just keep raising the resistance until we hit the target. So here is the distribution after we do this verify. So here you see that uh, without verify, then the load and state, let's say with a single red pulse, then you have a long tail. And then with the uh, tightened uh, uh, window, then you can uh, make the resistance more, 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 uh, more, this is more uniform. But again, it's not like as sharp as a vertical line here, right? So still we have some margin in terms of hundreds on around a few kilo. And then for the high run state, we must do, do the verify. You, you see that after a, after a single pulse, then most of the cells cannot reach this seven X, seven times on off ratio. We must do the verify by multiple programming and then that make most of the cells above this threshold. So here, since we have the on-chip retina verify, we can do this in automated program. And uh, this could speed up the entire array's programming. Otherwise, if you use a off-chip uh, instrument, then you have to do it cell by cell. It takes forever to do like a 64 kilobit array. So the other challenge is uh, ADC, because you know, analog circuit suffer from the PVT variation. And uh, here, just to give you some idea about this uh, sense margin degradation at higher temperature. So here, this is uh, like the ADC ideal output. This is the partial sound, weighted sound from the computation. And then this will be converted to the sense voltage of the bit line. And then we have to design the ADC references to quantize the output. But uh, as you can see here from the uh, measurement, so the bit and voltage will change at different temperature, even for the same partial sum. This is because the RN resistance will change. But if you use a fixed V reference, then you will have some error, especially for the higher partial sum value. So here we have to fine tune the V reference but it's very difficult to find the references because you have to track the temperature. So it's uh, uh, better to have the built-in self-tracking of the references. So the idea is also very straightforward. We can use some dummy colon to generate those ADC references. So here, the idea here is that we have some dummy colon and then we can have some programmable pattern of the cells. Uh, depending on the number of cells in the on state, off state, then we can fine tune the ADC references. You will use those cells to generate the references. So this could also compensate some of those process variations because uh, you can fine tune some of those patterns. It's not necessarily you have this uh, pattern for this ADC. For the next ADC, maybe due to the mismatch, you have to fine tune the pattern a little bit. But you can make the uh, output uh, uh, code more robust by fine tuning the pattern. And also, this pattern is made of the RN cell. So, this could self track the temperature because all the RN cells of the dummy cell and then the real quantum cell they will drift together. So, here are some measurement data uh, at different temperature in terms of the ADC output. Uh, value, uh, which we count for the successful readout. And then at high temperature, you see that if we do nothing with the external fixed voltage reference, then the high partial sum values will be all wrong, essentially. 
And then with this on-chip uh, uh, self-tracking, we can recover most of the missing codes here, but still it's not ideal. Uh, but at least we can recover uh, many of those missing codes. So here, if we use the statistics from this uh, measurement to run some neural network application, so here, I think this is for CIFAR 10. And uh, uh, with this uh, technique, we can recover some of the accuracy loss. But still, as you can see, at 120 degrees Celsius, the accuracy is not as good as the room temperature. And also, the VDD uh, matters. So if we want to lower down the VDD to, know, to, to lower the power, then you see that this transfer curve the uh, internet voltage as a function of the ADC uh, output uh, will also shift. And especially at the high VDC, ADC output, then the sense margin between two states will become pretty close at the low VDD. So here then we would like to introduce the ECC to protect the arrows from the sensing. So here, I will not go through the algebra for the ECC scheme. This is a little bit different from the conventional ECC. So for the conventional ECC, you know, in the memory array, and you, you always have the ECC, but then the conventional ECC will turn on one row, and then, you know, just uh, sense one row, and then compute the syndrome based on the parity bits. But here, the challenge is that we turn on multiple rows to do the computing memory. So it's impossible to just uh, do the protection for one row. So here, the idea is not to protect individual bits. The idea is to protect the partial sum, because what you care about is the partial sum, your actual output instead of the individual bits. So we don't protect the individual bits, we, take, we protect the summation results. So with this principle, so here I will not go through the procedures. I mean, there are uh, 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 you know operations like the you know the, the uh, modular operation, and then you do some uh, uh, kind of. I will explain that in the next slide. But uh, uh, the the idea is that we add the parity bits, add some additional logic to do the decoding. So here, when you do the encoding, of course, for the uh, uh, data, then you do it off chip, but for the decoding is during the runtime. So we are going to add a few logic module to do this uh, decoding, and we can do it in a pipeline fashion. But here I will not go into the details. We have to add some multiplier, a modular like a, a logic to do that. Uh, so essentially, we we'll add some overhead to do the sensing. So with this technique then we can evaluate uh, how effective we can recover the accuracy loss. So here, uh, if we do not uh, protect anything, then if we manually inject the bit error rate uh, uh, to this uh, network, to all the weights, then the accuracy will drop as a function of the bit error rate. And uh, uh, here, the idea is to protect only the MSP. So the second curve, the red curve, is the result. If we only, if we protect, let's say, apply the ECC to the MSB only, while we left other bits unprotected. So even the only the MSB is protected, you see that the accuracy could be maintained pretty much. So the, here. As I said, when we add the ECC, we will introduce overhead. So we want to minimize the overhead. So here we suggest that we could only just uh, protect the MSB. And well, of course, if you want to protect more, you can protect the other bits. But the MSB is the most effective bit to be protected. So with this scheme, then we can uh, evaluate. Of course, there are many uh, you know, implementations of the ECC depending on the with a bit width for the data and the bit width for the parity bit. So if you add more parity bits, then you are going to have stronger protection. Then uh, you can recover the uh, uh, loss even more. So with this, this is the measurement result. Uh, 
so at higher partial sun, if we reduce the voltage, power supply voltage, then we will uh, have the suffer from the uh, accuracy loss. But with the ECC turned on, we can recover some of the loss. So you, this is a measurement result, but we have to translate to the accuracy uh, in terms of the network. So here you see that uh, if we use this uh, 16, every 16 bits with 10 bit uh, parity, then we can pretty much maintain the uh, accuracy uh, even down to 0.7 volts, of course, with uh, like one person accuracy drop. So this is a summary uh, of the chip. And uh, uh, we can do the DVFS if you wish. Uh, uh, we can have the lower VDD. Uh, but of course, uh, this will come with lower frequency. Uh, but then the energy efficiency could be improved. So this is a trade-off. And uh, uh, this is uh, the chip summary. I will not uh, repeat the many details. And uh, 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 this is, again, TSMC 40 nanometer RAM process. So should I take questions here or wait until the end? Maybe we can be more interactive so we can, uh, uh, yeah.它的对上那个那个那个那个那个那个那个那个那个那个那个那个那个那个那个那个那个那个那个那个那个那个那个那个那个那个那个那个那个那个那个那个那个那个那个那个那个那个那个那个那个那个那个那个那个那个那个那个
the charges. And then we are going to convert the voltage, analog voltage on the caps to the pulse width through a ramp, ramp generator. So here there's no explicit ADC implemented in this design. So here you see the output from the first array here will be the voltage on the cap, cap uh, on the cap, so it's voltage amplitude. And then after the ramp generator, we convert to the pulse width modulation, which is directly fed into the second array. So here, this is the detailed design. So instead of the ADC, we replace the ADC with this kind of a circuitry. And uh, here is current uh, 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 subtraction because we have the positive weight and negative weight and with this current mirror. Then here, this current essentially is the IP mass IN, the difference between the positive weight current and the negative weight current. And this current is also mirror to here, or maybe downsize a little bit because the current is too large. And then if we have a large current, then we have to have a large cap. So we have downsize, downsize the current through the mirror. And then this current will charge up this cap. And then depending on the ramp generator, then we are going to convert the voltage to the pulse width, essentially after this comparator. So here are some more details in the implementation. So the first one, uh, here we do the uh, uh, compute phase, and then we're going to charge up the uh, uh, cap. And then phase two, we're going to hold that uh, voltage for a while. And then in the third phase, we're going to use a ramp a ramp signal to com com compa uh, compare the ramp voltage to the uh, temporary voltage that is held on the edge cap. And then it can regenerate this kind of pulse, pulse waveform. So there are many controls, and uh, I will just skip the details due to the time limit here. And here are some measurement uh, results. So here, uh, so this is set up. I will skip that. Uh, but here, uh, you see that here the pulse uh, max value decreases, and then we generate the pulse width, and that also proportional to the max value. So here, this is still. You know, this still suffer from the variations. So here you see that uh, this is measured uh, output uh, in terms of nanosecond from the uh, waveform and with the ideal value normalized. So here you see that some scattered points along the uh, fated NAN. So there's variations. Uh, so this will impact the accuracy. So if you run the neural network. So here we have some, uh, in terms of the uh, variation, uh, 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 that deviate from the ideal dash nine. Then here for the simulation from you know the simulation, then we have if you run some Monte Carlo simulation, you get like two point nine percent. But after the measurement, and this becomes even larger, like four point four percent around this nine. So here we inject this four percent variation into the neural network simulation. Then this is how it look like. Uh, for the different network and for different data sets. So here, essentially, if you have more and more variation along the uh, uh, the pathways, then you are going to have accuracy drop, but with 4%, so you have a little bit uh, degradation. So this is uh, uh, what we can achieve uh, through this uh, implementation. It's not perfect, uh, uh, so that's why today is, you know, it's, you, you have never seen any product based on analog computing memory because you have to address the accuracy problem. But uh, uh, here, if you can compare uh, the PPA, power area performance, right? So, so here, compared to our first design, because we, have, we can do apple to apple comparison because both chips are designed by us, uh, implemented in the same TSMC process. So here we can have some comparison between the first generation and second generation in terms of the here, for example, the area, the second generation reduces almost half per, uh, 50% because we get rid of many ADCs. And then here the throughput, energy efficiency, computer efficiency all improves because the pulse width is more efficient to encode the data. Uh, so you can uh, uh, run this with better efficiency. 
So here, this is a summary and a comparison table with other similar implementations uh, with R or even S run uh, technologies. So, so I will uh, skip the uh, comparison. But here, if you really uh, dig into the numbers here, for example, the normalized uh, energy efficiency, uh, our design uh, is pretty good uh, because the input width, input precision is encoded by the pulse width, which could be pretty high, high precision, and, and, and compared to the bit serial you know, implementation as for the inputs. So here I have to you know, emphasize a little bit on the TOPS per watt. So sometimes this is a very confusing metric <laughs> in the literature. So you have to normalize that, okay, to the precision. You're like a, you know, eight bit by eight bit Mac, and uh, uh, compared to one bit by one bit Mac, right? So by itself, that's a 64 times difference. So so when you talk about the uh, uh, energy efficiency, you have to normalize to the precision. Okay, so this is uh, the summary of the second uh, chip. I will skip the uh, uh, details. And uh, I will stop uh, if you have any question. Uh. Yeah. Product. Uh -huh. Clock rate. Yeah. 就是那个, uh, 呃,就是时脉, cycle time, 拉长, 哦, 那是不是它的精确性就会提高? Uh, OK, OK, 是, 是, 因为它那个, 呃, 但是你, 它的throughput会降低, 那这个问题应该是, 因为两边在比较的时候, the first design, the second design, probably 都一样嘛, 应该是不一样, 因为你要, uh, 你要用 per suite, 要 encode, 就是 multiple bit, right? 那理论上你的effective的那个 cycle time, 对，会变变低。会变长一些，对。第三个地方我记不住这个clock，呃，clock是多少来着？还是一百吗？但是，但是，但是，但是，但是，但是，但是，但是，但是，但是，但是，但是，但是，但是，但是，但是，但是，但是
And within this uh, 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 self-attention module, there are many operations. And uh, here, comp one, one difference is that here you have this uh, matrix multiplication, and uh, the input and the both input and the weight are generated on the fly. The, the, so this is different from those linear layers where you can pre-train the weights. So here, then we have to address those different characteristics or features uh, uh, of those sub-block differently. So here, this is a proposal. Of course, you know, uh, uh, looks good on PowerPoint. It's uh, hard to build in, in, in reality, but uh, let's say this is uh, 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 the future. So here, uh, we would like to leverage the advantages, let's say, of RN computing memory, and uh, also the digital CRM uh, with SRAN. And here, the idea is that we can store all the model parameters with the on-chip RN, but we have to split that maybe into multiple uh, dice due to the capacity. Uh, and then, if we can utilize the advanced packaging, like uh, hybrid bonding and the TSV these days, we can properly you know, stack this. And then on the bottom, then we can have, a, let's say if we stay with 40 nanometer, I know TSM has more advanced RAM, but so far we only have had access to 40 nanometer. TSM has 22 nanometer RAM. But let's say if we stay with 40, and uh, due to the cost or other reasons, and then the digital CRM could be more advanced, and the best PDK we can access is 16, so we choose 16. If you can access seven or three, then you can do, do that. But what we can do is 16 from a university. So uh, here, the idea is that we can do, uh, uh, use the more advanced node uh, logic to function as the control or prefer for the RAM and also for the digital CRM. And then we can do the 3D stacking. So essentially, one PE is here become a 3D cube. And here, then the RAM is used for the linear layer with the self-attention module because those uh, layers could have the trend parameters. Because we do not want to write RN, I mean, during the wrong time. We just want to, you know, use RN for the inference. Just write it once and then read. Because to program is very expensive. So, but SRAN, you know, is easy to write, rewrite. So SRAN could be used for the, you know, the, the, um, a matrix multiplication uh, uh, because those inputs are generated at the wrong time. So, and we can utilize S and digital CRM to do that. So, this is a proposal. And here are more details. R run could be similar as what we just described so far. Um, but S run, you know, the, uh, you can add some local logic gate uh, to the S run cell. And uh, so, there are several papers. Uh, pioneered by TSMC and also I think recently MediaTek also published quite a few papers on the SRAM based DCIM. Um, so here we we didn't innovate those designs. We just borrow the designs from our past R and tape out or from the industry's digital CIM implementation. So here what we want to do is to evaluate the system in the 3D fashion. So here one challenge as you may question, okay. Always, I mean, if anyone talk about 3D, then you cannot get rid of the thermal issue. Uh, so especially when you stack multiple tiers, right? So here we have done the analysis uh, to do the electrothermal co-simulation uh, using the ANSYS uh, software. So here we have multiple tiers, and then we have all the thermal parameters and also the bonding parameters. And then consider the you know heat removal efficiency depending on the, your cooling. You can do air fan, you know, or even more advanced liquid cooling. Then you could have different coefficient for the heat removal. Uh, so here, I believe we use some um, air cooling. We, we didn't use some advanced uh, liquid cooling in this case. And then the intercalate assumption, those TSV assumption, is close to the AMD's 3D V cache uh, implementation. So here then for the electrical uh, metrics, so here are some uh, numbers. So if we stay with the baseline, that is 2D implementation, that means R and S are co-located on a 2D die, monolithic 2D die, then those are the estimated 
performance. And then with a 3D heterogeneous 3D implementation, then the digital and then the peripheral circuits of the RAM could be at more advanced node. And then we can sh uh, shrink the footprint. And also, but total silicon cost is also reduced because we use more advanced node for the digital. And then the uh, computer density could be much improved because the form factor is reduced and energy efficiency is also improved. And then we also evaluated the parasitic capacitance and resistance of those TSV, and uh, we found that it's very minimal to the signaling because we are not running at very high frequency. So this is uh, uh, more interesting, so the thermal. So here, this is the temperature uh, of the profile in the 3D stacking, this is just one layer, and the temperature is around 57 Celsius, so it's not big. Uh, problem in this particular case. This is because in our implementation, we are running this 3D cube layer by layer. We are not running them in parallel. Okay. So if we run them in parallel, then if we do the pipeline, then this could be a challenge. But at least for the layer by layer execution, then only one layer is activated, then still the thermal is manageable in this case. So this is just the example of starting point to evaluate the system design, how to best uh, partition the system into different implementations and also consider the uh, packaging and thermal and uh, uh, electrical and then, you know, this is just a code design co-optimization exercise. By no means, this is the best implementation. I just want to, you know, share some methodologies we used for the evaluation. Okay, so the last uh, 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 talk, second to the last topic, switching RN to ferroelectric. Okay, so actually, that group recently spent more effort on the ferro uh, than RN. I have been working on RN for almost 15 years now, from the device physics to, to today's chip design tip out. Um, so, ferro, as I introduced earlier, provides some new advantages or new features. So here, uh, as I said, so you replace the data dielectric to the ferroelectric material, which could have the built-in dipole. And then if all the dipoles are pointing down, then this you know, positive charge near the surface of the silicon will induce, more easily induce the inversion charges. That means the threshold voltage is lower. So you can apply a gate, a gate voltage positive gate voltage to lower the threshold voltage. And then this is called program. So if you erase, you can apply a negative gate voltage or you apply a positive voltage from the substrate. Then you will pointing up the dipoles and then this will help accumulate the holes. So this is unfed, an unchannel device. So uh, here you can control how many because here you have many domains uh, under the gate, you can control how many of them are pointing up or pointing down, pa partially polarize the ferroelectric layer. Therefore, you can get multiple threshold voltage. Therefore, you can create the multi-bit memory. And uh, uh, as I said uh, earlier, so here advantages over the resistive counterpart is lower right energy because it's field driven. You do not pass current through the gate to program. And also compare, so if you look at this device, very similar to flash, right, actually. Flash is charge trap. The only difference is that this device, the switch is counterclockwise and the flash is clockwise. So here, when you apply positive voltage, the threshold voltage is lowered. And in the flash, the threshold voltage is increased. But compared to the flash or charge trap, then here you have lower red voltage around three volts and much faster write a speed down to 15 hours second. So here, this is the IND status of the FEFET technology. It has been, you know, reported by LAMLAB, Germany, uh, around 2011. And since then, the community has gained more and more interest and with the industry investment. So I would say Global Foundry has uh, been pioneering in this field. Uh, using the silicon dope hafnium oxide in the front end uh, process. And then they have demonstrated the FE fat in the 28 nanometer and 22, 22 nanometer platforms. 
and uh, uh, this is front end integration and then the uh, back end you can also integrate the FE as the back end of the LAN using some oxide channel material for example here as demonstrated by Intel. Intel didn't disclose what is a channel but uh, we believe it's oxide channel we don't know uh, so here there are some challenges of course with the FE FET. so variability due to the multi-domain nature and the reliability due to the interfacial layer the, uh, and then the charge trapping as well. So this is the uh, status of the FE FET. And uh, uh, at least the Global Foundry has uh, entered into the risk manufacturing phase of the FE FET. So here uh, at Georgia Tech, we have set up our in house AOD system dedicated for the ferrinetric uh, material growth. And also we have a very active collaboration with Global Foundry, and this is a 300 millimeter wafer Global Foundry sent to my lab for measurement. So we characterize the technology with Global Foundry. And also we did the first tip out with Global Foundry 28 nanometer FE FET. So this is uh, 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 still under their internal R&D, so it's not uh, really publicly available, uh, but you know through my relationship. So. Uh, we got some early access to the to, to their technology, and uh, here I just uh, we didn't do anything new in the circuit design. So I just want to compare the technology, let's say from the RN to the Ferro, and uh, here the design is pretty similar. And here uh, we just estimated the energy efficiency and the uh, uh, compute density. So roughly speaking. So the energy efficiency is 10 times better, and the compute density is 30 times better. If you switch from 40 nanometer R run to 28 nanometer FE FET, just by the technology itself, you get the boost. We didn't do anything new in the circuit. Is that still the same ADC, flash ADC? This is a, the, not the third, first R run. This is not the second R run. This is similar to the first R run, still with the ADC. Okay, so then I just want to introduce something new from our lab. Uh, of course, we have the active collaboration with Global Foundry, but in my lab, still we have something new uh, uh, from our own samples. So here, I just want to introduce this ferrometric tunable capacitor concept. So this is different from the FE run or FE FET, and uh, this is a new phenomenon. Uh, if you have a, a symmetry, in the CV, small signal, I have to emphasize, small signal CV is not large signal PV. PV, you know, polarization versus voltage is a large signal switching. So here, this is a small signal CV. If you have the a symmetry, then you can use the capacitance state as a DC zero voltage to represent the memory state. So you can have a high capacitance state and no capacitance state. It's like you have high resistance state and no resistance state, but here is a capacitor. So here in our sample, we suspect that the interface between the tie nitride and uh, half zirconium oxide interface, the top interface and bottom interface is a little bit different. So because we have a plasma uh, uh, treatment to the uh, uh, bottom interface, so we have more oxygen vacancies there. So there could be some positive charge that could pin the domain even after we apply the three volt uh, switching voltage. So that means we may have more domains after the positive sweep, the domain wall, you know, at, at the small signal input, you have basically a, a dumped some charges to the plate. So then this domain wall will expand. You have some domain wall, mo, domain wall motion. So here then this, you know, domain expand, and then this will introduce more charges to the plate that will be translated to higher capacitance. So here, with this idea, we can implement the computing memory using the capacitive charge domain computation instead of the resistive current domain computation. So here, this is a simple demo uh, we published two years ago at IADM. And uh, so here, this is a small crossbar array, and each cross point is this capacitor we just showed earlier. And then you can decouple this uh, computation into two phases. The first one is to still, you can turn on multiple rows, and then the input voltage represents your input data. 
and then you will charge up the array. And then depending on the on and off state of the weights, you will charge up differently. And then the second phase is to ground the input and then transfer all the charges through this op amp to the, to the outside and then scale through the C reference. You can transfer all the charges to the output voltage. So essentially the output voltage will represent the dot product in this case. So here, you know, this is early stage research. We only have this crossbar array made, you know, by our <laughs> clean room. And then we don't have the peripheral circuits control. So all the peripheral circuits here in the op amp and the switch matrix are on the PCB board. And then we have very complicated setup in the testing. But nevertheless, we can imp uh, uh, demonstrate the output voltage is proportional to the number of the capacitors that is in the on state in the array, and also is proportional to the input that is in the one uh, input one state. So this is a small scale uh, uh, demonstration. But I just want to highlight what is a if you compare and say resistive approach versus a capacitive approach, what's, what's the essential difference? So the essential difference is that the resistive approach, once you turn on the input voltage, then you are passing the current through the resistor. You consume the DC static power. So as long as you have the input high, then you consume the current to consume the power. So the capacitor, you only consume the dynamic power Right, in the transient uh, uh, operation. So you can be much more energy efficient. Right? You do not pass, uh, consume any current when the input stabilizes. So this could be much more energy efficient. We estimated the next three times to 10 times better energy efficiency at the array level. So essentially this is a, a, a good. And also, you know, resist your approach, you may have the uh, IR drop, if your current is large, then the wire, you know, IR drop will be a problem. And here, this one, you do not have that problem. So, uh, and also the capacitive approach, then we can stack multiple capacitors, but potentially at the back end, so we can do the 3D stacking. Mm hmm mm hmm mm hmm Okay, good point. So uh, we measured, you know, from the normal, say, uh, let's say, integrated semiconductor parameter analyzer, right? The CV unit built in, you can measure to up to 10 megahertz. And uh, we, we measured uh, up to 10 megahertz. This is uh, the, 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 the behavior is like this. And then we also, uh, I didn't quote the paper here, we also had a RF test structure where we have the GSG probe with IF testing. We measured up to, I believe, two gigahertz. Still, we have, but the window shrink at higher frequency. You still have some dispersion. Um, but still, the, the trend is there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so that, that's a different story. So for the circuit, actually, even for this uh, demonstration, you are not using the AC signal to, uh, because in the CV measurement, you test the CV using the AC sense order wave as input, right? But for the actual implementation like this one, your input is a rectangle pulse. So here, I didn't have that figure here, but it's in the IDM paper. So we verified that uh, the what you really care about is, is the integral of the charge, uh, uh, which will have two, levels if you have uh, the capacitance high and capacitance low. So what you care about is, is the integral of the charge and we measure the charge. And the, uh, the input voltage uh, is 100 millivolts, I believe. And then the pulse is like uh, 100 nanoseconds, something like that. So uh, uh, it's a rectangle pulse. You don't need to have the AC like the sense of the wave. You just need a, a, a rectangle pulse and then you dump some charges as long as the charge that you dump to the reference capacitor is different, could be differentiated, then you can use this for the computation. You don't need to really count on that k value, right? 
essentially you are doing like uh, just a uh, differentiate some charges essentially. So um, unfortunately, no, this is just, uh, you know, hypothesis and uh, like a physical mechanism. We don't have a direct way to verify. Mm -hmm. Ferro, people have measured that. So not uh, uh, us, but uh, people have uh, measured the Actually, my colleague, Professor Asif Khan, I, they ha have shown the real-time image under the PTM to show the domain wall, not domain wall motion, but you know the phase transformation from the monolithic phase to the orthohomic phase. They have shown that, but not the domain wall motion. Mm -hmm. That's different. So you are talking about, yeah, you are, uh, exactly right. So here from the geometry, it's not, not like a, a green, but electrically here we are talking about the domain, which is uh, different from the, uh, you know, the structure, uh, like a monolithic or you know, also some big phase, right? So, so electrically, it's hard to, you know, this <laughs> visualize the domain, right? So that's, that's why this is that's just like a cartoon figure. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yes. Okay, the first, uh, how to program it. So we apply large volt in next three volt, positive three, ne negative three volt. So you can program it. And after that, we use small signal. That means we use a very small voltage to read, like 100 millivolts. So if that does not disturb the, so here you see. No, it's different. Actually, no, it's different from the d run. D run, you know, you charge up the D run capacitor, and then the charge is temporarily stored there, and then it will leak if your excess transistor has leakage, right? So this is different. This one, the state is non-volatile. The high and the low capacitance is the state. So D run, you only have one capacitance, and then the state is measured by the how many charges on the capacitor, right? This one, the state is, uh, you know, encoded as a high and the low non-volatile capacitance values. Yeah, this is different from the run. This is different from FE run. This is what we proposed. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we measure at the DC zero voltage. And when we use it for the uh, actual computation, we apply like 100 millivolts, just a small voltage. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So time is short. Oh, you. Now, now we'll skip the neural signal. Ah? Uh? <laughs> sorry, sorry. So, so yeah. If others have other commitment, feel free to leave the room. So I don't want to hold everybody here. You know. So, so lastly, I just want to you know advertise our neural scene uh, a little bit more. Uh, some um, some of you have heard of this, and this is open source simulator for AI hardware, and this is our GitHub uh, page. And recently, we just released a new version 1.4. And uh, uh, here are just uh, some impact. Uh, we have enabled more than 500 publications in the field and more than 100 users are using our tool, including researchers from industry. 
and uh, we have won the TCAT Best Paper Award, and our students uh, also uh, won the Best Dissertation Award. So here the methodology is that we want to evaluate the system and uh, uh, the, the key metrics, like the training inference accuracy and those TOPS, TOPS per watt, TOPS per millimeter square. And, but we don't want to run the full spy simulation because it's too slow. And here we want to extract the device parameters to the circuit level and also to the architecture through some hierarchy. And it's also consider the data flow. So here the, the hardware design knobs, we have different technology supports and different technology nodes, and then we can consider different neural network structure. And then I will uh, skip some details due to the time limitation. So we can support the quantized training and the inference for different uh, neural network models. And then we can uh, have some PPA estimation for the key circuit module. And some modules are calibrated with the spice at the module level, not the entire system level. And then we have different options for the interconnect and also the off-chip DRAM access, LPDDR. And then we also consider the training or the inference accuracy degradation due to the non-ideal properties, you know, for example, variation or reliability drifts and so on. So here, uh, I just want to show the extension. Um, many of those are not publicly available, but, but through the active collaboration, we can share the codes. So th th those extensions are not on the GitHub, okay? <laughs> so first one is that we want to support the reconfigurable architecture because uh, we believe that one you know, hardware should support multiple different neural network models, should not be like a custom design. So we need to add the reconfigurable switches uh, to the uh, 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 a neural scene, so we can enable the mapping for different uh, algorithms to the same hardware. And also, monolithic 3D, if we have the uh, technologies, you know, as we are currently working on the oxide semiconductor for the backend, and we can integrate, uh, uh, for example, RN, if you RN's access transistor is not silicon, it's oxide transistor, you can stack the entire RN tier to the backend. So we can support that. Uh, with the backend oxide transistor. And the heterogeneous 3D, I already showed the example earlier, the vision transformer 3D stacking. So we support the uh, bonding and the TSV and thermal simulation. And then also there is interest to do the cryogenic uh, computation. So we update the technology parameter, especially the transistor parameters at the 77K and 4K calibrated to the data and then we can enable the low temperature operation. And finally, 3D NAND is a special case. So we have to make a, a, some adjustment for the 3D NAND technology. And uh, 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 also we believe that through the bonding, so your 3D NAND can interface the advanced logic to do some large model, because this is the only way. If you want to do the large model, like gigabyte, terabyte, so, 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 uh, you know, what we discussed so far, RN, FEFET, they're good for, you know, maybe computer vision problem, tens of megabytes embedded uh, space. But if you want to talk about the large model like this, language model, graph model, genome sequencing, then those data are stored in SSD anyway. So, so you have to somehow reconfigure your 3D NAND to support that. So we're working on that, like uh, in memory search in the 3D NAND, uh, in memory computing in the 3D NAND. So here, extension roadmap. Uh, so here, in the recent uh, release, V1.4, we updated the technology support to one nanometer load, of course, based on the industry's roadmap. And uh, 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 this is already uh, released uh, on the GitHub. So here, we incorporate some of the industry trends, for example, in the standard cell estimation, you know, the finity population uh, is ongoing, and we should reduce the metal track. Right, so you can, you know, this case, the CPP does not really scale, rough scales is the height of the standard cell. And then the DT cell and the backside power delivery, the buried power rail, you know, also help to reduce the standard cell size. And then we also uh, uh, make a case, two nanometer, fin fat become, you know, get all around stack another sheet. 
And then um, 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 in the future, we want to support the 3D CFET, you know, complementary N on top of P or P on top of N. So we have to support those new technology trends. And uh, we do, doing this, we, we can continue support uh, the, the uh, digital CRM uh, because digital CRM enjoys the benefit of the scanning, right? So, so this is what we... Hit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 现在我现在是backside那边是接着PCB那边。对,对,对,对。Signal. Uh-huh, uh-huh,对。Good question. <laughs> uh, open, 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 open question for research. Yeah, the benefit, uh, trade off, yeah. trade off. Yeah. Um, Okay, okay, this, uh, those are the parameters we updated for the technology trends. So, so of course, you know, some up based on the prediction, not the industry real numbers. And then we also calibrate the transistor parameters. Uh, uh, and we also need to extract the prosthetic uh, RC, especially the capacitance for some of those uh, PPA estimation. And also uh, don't forget about the interconnect. Interconnect play a critical role in many of those system level uh, uh, metrics and then and as we continue shrink you know the um, resistivity continue increases and especially uh, if you consider the barrier right titanium nitride right with the copper then the surface to volume ratio increases your titanium nitride resistivity will play more role in the interconnected resistivity so that's why it's tricky. And also for the VR, and you know, people are introducing the ruthenium and you know, some cobalt ruthenium and, 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 and without the barrier, right? So, so we have to update the technology assumptions. So uh, facing the architectures uh, community, we are trying to build the bridge uh, from our neural scene, essentially the technology, you know, uh, 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 simulator. Uh, uh, which can produce some circuit level metrics uh, like latency, power, energy. Uh, but we have to interface with the system simulators. For example, here we have some exercise with a TAN loop, which was published by you know MIT and NVIDIA. And this is a simulator for the digital systolic array TPU neck architecture. And then we have an interface there. So now we can simulate the TPU kind of uh, architecture. And also we have some interest to interface uh, with Gen5, which is, you know, is a common simulator for the computer architecture community. So this is more towards the conventional CPU, GPU workloads. And uh, uh, we're interested in, you know, for example, if we replace the last level cache with some new design, new technology, uh, what would be the benefits? And uh, finally, this is uh, what, uh, this is my favorite. So, uh, we are interested in the 2.5D and 3D integration, and, uh, uh, and uh, we are adding the technology support for the TSV IO link, high speed IO link, interposer, uh, hybrid bonding, uh, thermal heat, heat spreader, and so on. So the eventual goal is to you know develop the system on the package. 
and uh, this uh, this is uh, necessary, especially if, you, for example, your transformer model or GPT, right? So must be the cheap net uh, uh, solution because the model is so large, and then you have to utilize the heterogeneous technologies as we just showed earlier, the 3D cube, right? Some of those could be computing memory, could be the digital, could be the systolic array. So, so uh, we have to partition the system. All right, so I can skip the summary. I think I covered uh, all those uh, points. And finally, I'd like to thank TSMC for providing us the RNT Pulse Shuttle and also Global Foundry for the collaboration in the Faro and all the federal agencies and also the industry sponsors for our research. So I have all the activation, uh, collaborations with all the major semiconductor companies and also including Google. You think Google is uh, <laughs> Google Silicon, yes. All right, thank you. Hey. 我非常谢谢那个余教授精彩的演讲大家可以看到横跨这个device电路还有实作然后它roadmap几乎都是现在最流行的尤其是在large我们接下来是做后默克的时间哈还不能离开那就是有没有问题要请教于老师的请啊啊五十对啊底外值比较高 Ansys, Ansys, your, power, okay. your temperature the limit. Okay, okay. That, that, uh, the different scale. You said it's transistor self-heating, or temperature is more high. But the temperature is already spread out after the chip level. Okay. Uh, 对,那不是device level的local的temperature 它这个temperature的input是你chip那个power density 是那个module level的power density 对,不是device,local-temperature 那个temperature应该是一个 Average之后的一个temperature 因为它的input是个power density 
另外的讨论。哦，因为您您问的，您用了 quota 的，我因为这边也会举手。哎，刚刚提到的那个比较新的哈，在三 D 的 NAND 哈，或啊 Vertical NAND 来做这个啊 AI 的运算，就是 LLM 的运算。刚刚也有提的这样子的一个方案，但是 NAND 的这个啊绿的的速度非常慢，当然不用去谈 Erase Program 更慢了，对 ，Millisecond 绿的大概 Microsecond，Micro 对，那。这样子的速度用在 AI 的运算啊的这一个啊考量会是怎样子的可行性啊？另外一个是这样子，就是说在 in storage 的 processing， 就是 SSD 可以来做这一个啊做这个整个电脑系统呢的这个啊 central processing 呢 GPU 或 CPU。的 backup， 因为它的 density 很大，所以有这个 in circuit in in storage 的 processing。那这两件事情是不是一起来考量一下？那我第二个问题，我补充一个问题，刚刚在谈这一个 security， 那么这个啊、uh, weight 的这一个 protection， 用这一个 wire o l 的 gated 的去跟它做这个 weight 的 protecting 啊。就是啊、uh, ，data set model 不愿意被人家知道嘛，对不对？那是不是有可能从 sensor p l a n 那边的信息来反推？因为你如果只是 turn on 七个啊、uh, one night 的话，啊，就是这个 RAM turn on 七个 one night， 你你把 sensor p l a n 那边的信号跟 input 的信号再反推，大概也也推得出 weight 的里面的 content， 大概这两个问题。OK， 第一个问题 ，NAND 关于 NAND speed， 首先 NAND 肯定是不能用于这个呃 write intensive 的 workloads， 肯定都是 inference training 就不用不用想了。嗯，呃，如果是 inference 呢，看如果是做 analog computing memory， 就是你还是 turn on multiple NAND 呃呃呃 device， 然后你如果是 sum up the current， 那你的 current 会会增加，比一个比平时 read a single NAND cell。Read a single NAND cell, maybe 100 nanoN. That's why the latency is like a few microseconds to tens of microseconds. When you turn on multiple NAND cell in parallel, 那你那个速度是应该能做。我们 estimate 应该 tens of nanoseconds 是应该可以的，因为你的 current 可以到 microN 的这个 level. 所以如果你是呃呃 do in parallel, 这个 NAND 的 speed 是可以 improve. 嗯、呃，第二个问题是这个。呃、uh, ，X or Cipher 是最简单的，所以所以是有可能被人给呃给呃这个呃呃用 replay 或者 other other 这个呃 technique 是有可能 decrypt 的，所以这不是最好的一个呃呃呃呃 encryption， 但是最简单的 implement 的 overhead 最小的，所以我们只是做一个这个呃呃呃 initial 的这个 study， 嗯、呃，不一定是最好的，对。Hello， 那个谢谢于思梦老师的演讲。那我想要问你，这个 FE FAT 或是 capacitor 它的这个 on-off ratio 是多少？然后还是其他 on-off ratio 不用大，它只要 deviation 大的话， deviation 够小，那就可以作为这个操作这样。OK， 呃、uh, ， good question。首先，如果你是用 FE FAT， 我还忘了说到一个更好的这个 advantage， 它 on-off ratio 可以做到一百或者甚至一千，因为你 essentially 是。是个 transistor 的这个 sub threshold， 呃呃 region， 那你的这个 VTH， 你知道，呃改变一点，你的 on off ratio 可以做到一百甚至一千，所以它比 R 或者任何一个 two terminal device， 它的 on off ratio 都更更大，所以这是 F E FAT 的一个好处。呃，然后至于这个我们提到的这个 capacitor， 呃。我们自己的这个 sample， 它 on off ratio 非常小，甚至比 m r a n 还小，呃，就大概 1.2 左右，呃， on off ratio 大概 1.2 左右，呃呃，所以这并不是最好的 solution， 我们只是作为一个 proof of concept demonstrate a small scale， 呃呃 array， 呃，我这里呃呃，我们最近我们这里没有我没有呃 include 最新的这个呃呃这个 paper， 我们这是呃 by the way 这个是主要的一些 references， 呃 based on today's talk。
，比如两个 tapeout 的 GSS 和 VOSS symposium， 嗯，是这个两个 chip 的 paper。然后最后一篇 paper 这里这个是我们最近刚刚几个月前跟 Global Foundry 合作的一个，呃呃 ，capacity， 呃 ，capacitor number 的还有 capacitor 的一个 design based on f e f f e c t 但是不是用 f e f f e c t 平常的这个 operation mode。在这个 device 上面，我们的 on-operation 能做到25左右， 2 5到30啊、呃，是 capacitive 的 on-operation， capacitance 的 on-operation 做到了30那我想要问第二个问题是，你说你们这个可以独立读写，就是做一个 three terminal， 那这个对于你做这个3 D 的叠叠层来说，会不会有什么好处？嗯、呃， three terminal 最后的好处是你 write and read decouple。然后跟三 D 来说并没有直接的这个呃关系，你你阿瑞你也可以做三 D， 如果你的 access transistor 是是可以这个 stack， 嗯，谢谢。啊、uh, ，你好，我想请教一下，在那个 R r a m 两个晶片呢、哦、，Generation One 跟 Generation Two， 其实大家都可以看出来，呃，瑞所占整个晶片的面积是不大的。那刚刚在演讲里面提到，就是说 ADC 所占面积其实蛮大的，所以把 ADC 的数目其实都减少，用 MAX 来处理。那这样的 ADC 其实就变得是瓶颈了哈，因为其实你你这个两百五十六个 Colon 下来，你可能要花好多次才能把它都 ADC 完毕。那呃，我想请教一下，就是说，那你们在算那个 TOPS per w a t 或者是 TOPS per millimeter？ 有把 l e c 算进去吗？那那个速度是不是整个都变慢了？就是说，它是那个是考虑到 ADC 的，是是变慢了的。比如八 max 八比一的话，那你就是 throughput 减减八倍了，减少八倍了。我那我另外想请教，就是说以这样来看的话，就是为什么呃看最后我秀了一个台积电的 digital CIM， 那就是说重新再做一次。还会用类比的方式做吗？还是其实就用数位就好了？<笑>因为到最后刚刚的那个 A C free 其实也只是两层而已。是，因为我们的 C N N 随便就是至少五层、七层以上。是，所以到最后你还是要转回数位才能接到第三层、第四层去，所以还是要 A D C。是，那我的换问是，因为您在 N L 这边做了很久，那重新再选择一次，你还会选 N L 吗？呃、uh, ，tough question 啊，嗯、um, ，我是说实话呢，还是还是跟 funding agency 或者 sponsor 说说说说是不一样的。那 funding agency 放出来 ，funding agency 已经这个呃呃放在了之前的 research， 嗯，那 going forward for practical application for actual product you have to choose digital。嗯哼，嗯哼，嗯哼。但是从发表 paper 来说，你当然 analog that's fine。嗯，比较 challenging。嗯。嗯。Digital 跟这一个 analog 的这个各有优缺点。那么现在有一个呃 proposal 是能够。Hybrid digital 跟啊、uh, analog， 那最主要在 transformer 的这个运算，它里面的 attention 呢是类似 convolution，、嗯、可是它里面的 embedding 类似这些 embedding 的工作，它的 resolution 是可以比较松。那 resolution 比较松呢，你可以用 analog 来做。那你你如果是像 convolution， 它需要这一个啊、呃、比较精准。那么用 digital 来做，所以会变成是说未来的技术很可能这个 digital 跟 analog 是可以做 hybrid 的的这个策略。对对对,对 ，good point。你要 check 这个 sensitivity of your application， 那你这看你的 application 是是什么？你的 application 如果只是个 camera surveillance，、呃、不是什么特别重要的，嗯 ，analog 你 no no power， 然后你这个 nap 呃 battery nap time， 嗯、呃，你考虑这个的话，那是可以的。那你要用来做 self driving， 那肯定是不行的，你可不能有这个 error， 对
，抱歉，抱歉，大刘老师，等一下，我我刚才问完就就给你把我时间留给你这样。那个，哎、欸，请问一下，那个于老师，那你刚才提到一个比较很有趣的，就是在有你有下一个芯片是完全是在 Global Foundries f e f a c t 嘛，对不对？然后跟你 R N 之间比较，两、嗯、代比较嘛，对不对？一个是二十八纳米的 f e f a c t 的 C I N， 然后另外一个是四十纳米台积电的。阿润的 C I M 嘛，对不对？嗯、那你你那个结果秀出来是说大概有一千倍的 energy efficiency， 还是几倍的？就是很大幅度的提升这样子。嗯哼。那这个提升的幅度是因为 F E F A 的关系吗？还是 mostly F E F A？ 但 technology scanning 有一定帮助，但是你知道 digital technology scanning 不会有。对对对对对对对,对,对。所以我比较好奇，因为刚刚讲到 F E F A， 其实最主要。我因为我 device 不是专家这样，就是最主要好处是因为是 write 跟 energy 的一些。呃，倒也不是，但因为我们的。这个 tape 那 computer memory 是 inference chip， 所以是 care about the read。对。呃，所以说最重要的那个呃呃 parameter 是刚才说了 R N 的 unstate resistance of few kilo ohm。嗯。你 F E F A T 的 unstate resistance 可以做到一百个 kilo ohm。OK OK， 所以其实是 un s t a t e resistance， 所以我刚才觉得哎，所以是有其他那些原因导导致它有其他 factor 是导致是四十到二八这样会有改进，所以是最主要是 unstate resistance 的比较比较不一样这样子。嗯、对。主要原因 ，OK， 谢谢谢谢，嗯，没问题。呃、uh, ，nominal 呃呃 ，forty nominal 是 one volt。达瑞用 one volt 就够了。啊、哦，不是不是，那个 logic 是 one volt， 阿润这个你 programming 是 high voltage。high voltage 那可以不没没办法说多少 volt 吗？那我觉得应该大家都差不多吧，两到三伏。这是蛮复杂的，因为我们。你知道在 a d v a n c e d 上有一个问题，电压越来越低。对对对对对对。那一些特别的东西，电压都越来越高。所以就是笑话，你知道吗？呃，所以所以这个就是 b u s c a n a b l e 啊，所以所以所以阿软为什么呃呃现在台积就二十二，那更更小的就没有了？那不是因为阿软，不是因为阿软本身那个 cell， 它 cell 可以那个 filament， 你知道几个 nanometer cell 本身不是是大问题，它那个 support。呃 ，voltage I O， 你想七纳米的 I O 才一点几伏，一点一点一点三一点四点五。好，那那再请教，您认为 F E F A T 最低的 V D D 可以到多少 ？F E F A T 吗 ？F E F A T 对 ，F E F A T。F E F A T 看取决于你做 front end 的还是 back end integration。front end 的你做你做在 silicon 上面有 interfacial layer， 你主要的 voltage 降在 interfacial layer 上面，所以 front end 很难做低，大概呃做到二两两点几伏就不错了，嗯、呃。你如果你做 backend 的 new oxide semiconductor， 你这 paper 他们已经 demonstrate 大概一一点几一一伏一点二伏一点三伏都可以。那我们 front end 没有 interfacial layer， 我们的 paper v o s i 的就是没有 interfacial layer。OK， 对，那可以把 scale 更低。对对对。所以意思就是说 V D E scale 你是一个大问题。对。不不是说你任何 technology V D D 不够好 ，V D E 不够好是不能不能做不能被 integration 在一起的。是啊，你不能做 S O C integration。嗯。好、啊，懂，谢谢。不好意思，太久了。哎，呃，余教授你好哈，我是那个联发科啊、哦嗯，王道平。那今天其实我觉得教授讲的这个 overall picture 哈、哦，非常的好，非常的完整啊、哦，把这个呃 C I N 各种 type 都介绍很清楚。就说以工业界的角度来看哈、哦，就说即使用 S R N 去做 C I N 哈、哦。呃，也也是要面临一样的，有些那些呃不理想的 issue 啊，即使是 high density S R N 也有呃一些 mismatch effect 哈、哦，需要一些呃 assist circuitry 来补救哈、哦，所以看这个 R N 跟那个 F 呃 f e l l electric R N 哈，呃，我觉得现在其实是说工业界的看法是说，看这个定位在哪边，好、哦，这个应用 application 啊、哦，当然我们不能。呃，要求像 S R 那么 high accuracy，、嗯、但毕竟，毕竟它在那个 tops per watt 在 power efficiency 上是非常有优势的哈、哦，所以我觉得工业界就说，呃，可以做 trade off， 哦，部在部分情况其实是可以接受，哦，所以我想请问老师，就是说，你觉得这个呃，不管是 R R 哈，或是呃其他类型 SAM 的 type， 就是说。你觉得它定位哈、哦、是在哪边？就是说跟 benchmark 现在呃现在的 neural network chip 用呃 S R N 跟 f r e s h 的结合哈、哦嗯。那假如说要用呃，比如说现在还有 M R N 
阿润，要要怎么样定位才呃可以取代？好、哦，我不知道是可不可以用这个名字，用取代掉现在 S 润的这种态度。呃 ，S 润没法被取代。<笑>呃、uh, ，depend on application 这个呃、uh, high performance computing cloud data center 一定是 S run， 嗯，这个没有没有任何的这个 question mark， 啊，我们写 paper 也许可以写，但是 industry 我对 industry 说的一定是，嗯、啊，这个 R run F E F E D 这些有唯一有可能的 market 只是会在 I O T edge low cost low power device 上面。嗯、uh, ，所以它的这个呃呃呃 application 是是 limited， 嗯、uh, ，它很难 replace S run with S run three nanometer。刚才刘教授也说，你这个 technology 不 scale 管，你不是 three nanometer， 你你怎么去 compete？ 呃呃呃呃，这个呃还以后还 one nanometer 这个对吧 ？OK， 这对啊，这个呃，我想一般 marketing 可以理解，就是说在 accuracy 跟呃跟那个 power efficiency 上上上面做 trade off 哈。就是、说需要 high accuracy 的时候用 S RAM， 那在 L T H device 用呃 R RAM 啊 M RAM 对，哎，我想工业界应该是有这个理解了啦。对，哦，所以说，对，还有一点，呵呵就是说，呃，工业界其实也在观察，说什么时候可以 commercialize 这种呃 R RAM 或 M RAM 变成 commercial 的 product。那他们台积不是有吗？<笑>他们的。它有四十二八二二的 R run， 四十纳米 R run 是一定是个 commercial 的，二二我不知道有没有 public 的 available， 但是他们、呃、对对对对,对，其实就是说这里面其实有一个很，应该说有两个很重要关键，一个是 e a r rate， 就是那个良率，对，哦，一个就是 endurance， 对，对，我我不知道老师你做这个呃呃这些 tech trip 哈，这两这两个数据，然后你跟。两个数据吧，对，不能说。<笑><笑>对，这通常是方局的 competition。你你们是那个 TSMC 的 big customer， 你们可以直接问，你不要从从教授这里问就不不不不不大不大好。<笑>好，谢谢谢谢。开始就 delay 了十分钟了，想做一些好玩的都没有成功。不过后来。呃，那个余教授也很很好，就用了那个 laser pointer， 还有麦克风。我刚刚看了一下网络收音还不错，应该远端也获益很多哈。那呃，我我觉得这也是比的 range 很广，好、啊，真的是受益良多。我们再次啊热烈的谢谢我们今天的讲者啊于世蒙教授。好，那我觉得因为跟他互动过程，我觉得他一个是很厉害啊，虽然百忙哈、啊，那个 response time 都很快哈、啊，就是每次问他什么，他都很快回。我想如果各位各位有好的问题，或者我们实验室也是啊 adapt neural s c e n e 的一个团队啦，哈、啊，张那个。像那个呃，那个郑贵忠老师他们也是有用，所以大家回去觉得会跟你们研究有关，我也呃强力推荐使用 Neural Sync 哈、哦，这个这样的一个平台哈、哦，那让这个能够让这个一在随着 technology 都一路发展了、哦，这个都是大家所需要的。好，那我们今天啊 ，Zemina、呃、就到这边，好，谢谢大家。谢谢老师，休息一下。